Mini episode 1139 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at Sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, hello. Quick note at the outset. We recorded this right before the Andrew Luck and Lamar Miller news came out. So this preview reflects what we thought then, with an update at the end reflecting our present analysis. Hello everyone, welcome to the FDH Lounge. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here. This is our 2019 AFC South preview, and I have with me here today, uh, heir to a fine tradition in the FDH Lounge, uh, past co-hosts for these segments have been Kyle Ross and Chris Galloway. And uh, again, uh, condolences to good friend and original FDH Lounge dignitary Chris Galloway on the passing of his mother. Under the circumstances, we have gone out to the bullpen here. It is a deep, deep, deep bench here in the FDH Lounge. All was a lot of fine parts to bring in, uh, as has been demonstrated in the first two parts of our series previewing the NFL for this year. And as we move into the AFC South here today, Good friend, FDH Lounge Dignitary Platinum Smalls. Yes, it is Raymond Smalley. Yes, he is the proprietor of the fine sports and pop culture blog, always Googling at Lee Hammaker, at always Googling at Lee Hammaker dot blogspot dot com. Raymond, how are you today, my man? Uh, I am I am outstanding, and you used a bullpen analogy. That is apt, as I am much like uh, Mariano Rivera, and by that I mean we both once listened to Inner Sandman. Yes. Uh, I have that in common with him as well, uh, and it is one of my finest, uh, fondest sports memories, by the way, uh, seeing him get teed up by Sandy Alomar. I was in the bleachers for that awesome playoff game in 97 with my best buddy. Awesome sports memory. Thank you for bringing that back to the fore. Uh, I got to talk yeah, about... The night, the night that Sandy took our hand and took us off to Never Never Land. <laughs> I got to uh, wallow in the some of the joys of Cleveland sports in our last segment here with my ascendant Cleveland Browns in the AFC North. Uh, and uh, previous segment, uh, the, the rather poopy state of my 1A team, the Miami Dolphins. Uh, I don't have a dog in the race in this division here, the AFC South. It is... I'm just going to make a general statement here at, at the top. Fellow FDH Lounge dignitary Ben Chu has talked about that this looks like a year where the landscape is really kind of muddled in the NFL and that there seem to be a lot of teams that could go up or down and there, there's there's a lot more unpredictability in a lot more places. I agree with him and I think the AFC South is one of the divisions uh, that is sort of a metaphor for where the league is this year or a microcosm or whichever term I'm probably misusing. Do you agree? I No, I completely agree. I think any one of the four teams could win this division. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a division where they're not separated by much in terms of talent, uh, but coaching, front office, that will a lot of times come into play. The team that I'm picking to win the division, I think, is the best in both of those regards. Uh, their quarterback situation has been a little bit iffy here in the preseason, but I'm starting to read the tea leaves and get the sense that Andrew Luck will be back for the season opener. I speak, of course, of the Indianapolis Colts. A team that, uh, quite frankly, the best thing that ever happened to them was getting left at the altar uh, by the you know, Bill Belichick's mini me a year ago because Frank Reich comes in uh, and has an absolutely fantastic campaign. The front office is doing a great job of restocking this roster, which had been very fallow around Andrew Luck. And uh, again, a team that is only continuing to get better. Uh, the, the defensive coaching uh, was top flight as well last year. Uh, a lot of overachieving in terms of the coaching. The talent on the roster, I think, is catching up to the coaching. I've got the Colts at 11-5 and five winning the division. I know you are not always as high on the Colts as I am, so I don't necessarily expect you to agree with this. Uh, no. Uh, I, I, I managed to, uh, unlike you, I managed to stay away from Patrick Chung's stash this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> All right. Break it down, then. Andrew Luck, I... 
top five quarterback in this league, not in my eyes. Top ten quarterback in this league, certainly. Um, I, I, lo- I like Marvin Ma- Marlon Mack not as much as some. Um, Devin Funches, I've always been a fan of. Eric Ebron is an outstanding tight end. For the people that I read, I read one article the other day talking about uh, T.Y. Hilton is T.Y. Hilton is a five uh, as a top five wide receiver in this league. To that person, I would say, whatever you are drinking, I'd like a case. <laughs> you know, T.Y. Hilton is the La Quinta of NFL wide receivers. <laughs> I would, I would prefer. I, 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 I would, I would. You say La Quinta, I would say. He, he is like a quality in, and by that I mean when you stay in a quality in, the pillows are stuffed with hair they fished out of the bathtub frame. Oh, 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 oh. I'm, just, I'm just relieved you didn't make a black light joke. T.Y. Hilton, Hilton is a good wide receiver. He's a legitimate number two, but when I look at this offense, my overwhelming thought is offensive line I think is as good as, it's, it's certainly the best in the division, I think it's as good as anybody in this league. Um... You know, which is, I mean, if you wanted to put Houston's roster and Indianapolis's roster up against each other, the glaring difference between them and why I think the Colts can be more successful is the Colts have an offensive line, and the Houston Texans have five people standing in front of their quarterback, which is kind of an offensive line. Thank you, Lionel uh, Hutz. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, you know, I think that. When I look at the skill positions on this offense, to me, the phrase that comes to mind is that they are greater than the sum. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Individually, I don't know that I would take any one of the, uh, you know, either the running back, the two wide receivers, or the two tight ends. Collectively, yeah, they can be something very special. Defensively, there's you know, there's a lot to like. Jabal Shear, I was a huge fan of when he was in New England. Uh, ben Baganu, Ben Baganu is special. Justin Houston, obviously, we know what he can be. Clayton Gathers is fun. Malik Hooker, Kenny Moore um, lead what I think is a is, is is arguably the best secondary in the division. Yeah, Jalen Ramsey. Don't text me. Text Rick. Um, <laughs> but you know, all that said, I look at the you know I look at this roster again. Offensively, I think the whole is greater than some of its parts. Defensively, I agree with you. I think they overachieved. And while, yes, I also agree with you that the talent is catching up to the coaching, if you say they're overachieved, that leaves the possibility they could take a step back. Are they a playoff team? I think so. Are they good enough to win this division? Absolutely. Are they good, good, good enough to win the AFC Championship? As you are predicting, Rick, much like Chris Benoit on a certain night that you and I won't reference, you have to be out of your mind high. Wow. Wow. That uh, a Chris Benoit reference, stooping to that. Well, uh, all I can say is, again, uh, Quentin Nelson, one of the best players in the league, it keying that offensive line being together, uh, as, as you were referencing there. And uh, Malik Hooker is somebody where uh, th- this has become an annual tradition uh, in the FDH Lounge with me making this reference here, and one that I know that in recent years uh, doing these previews, Chris Galloway has greatly appreciated as well. There are players in this league, and I knew that it was a steal for them when they got Hooker when he dropped to them. There are players I refer to with the military term of force multiplier. They're not only a great player, but they make the players around them better, whether it be from uh, all the attention that they draw from, uh, from the offense or whatever the case may be. They make things easier for the players around them. Malik Hooker is one such player. He is a great player who also elevates those around him. I agree with that, and there are you watch tape of him, and just like a guy, I'll, I'll, throw, out, I'll throw out a guy that you're – that I was, that I was, that I loved coming out of the draft, and that your Miami Dolphins ended up taking. You look at a guy like Minka Fitzpatrick, yeah, and you can play him in single high, you can play him in stagger, you can play him in true two, you can play him as a slot corner, you can blitz him off the edge, you can play him at linebacker if you're going to go in a seven situation. Like you can do so many things with a player like that. Conversely, you can do so many things with a guy like Malik Hooker. He picks it up fast. He's obviously intelligent. And not only does he make those around him better, he makes your defense better because there are just so many options that you can use him for. Yeah. 
he, there's there's an awful lot that you can uh, you can deploy when you got a guy like him in there. And uh, again, a, a team like Indianapolis, I would say spoiler alert, except anyone who has already checked out Fantasy Football Draftology 2019, available on the main page of FantasyDraftHelp.com, would already know this, that I have picked Indianapolis to win not just the AFC South, but the AFC Championship. I'm going to stand by that. A team that is not far away from them good. in a number... By the way, good that you're going to stand by that, because I'm going to... I'm going to stand. Uh, I'm going to stand off the off the reservation and around the corner from that. <laughs> I'll stand. I may stand in Pittsburgh. I listen. I said that before there were any questions about Andrew Luck, but especially after uh, some of the research I did before recording here today, that uh, apparently the Andrew Luck thing may not be that bad. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stay on that hunch. A team where again, there's not much to separate. Indianapolis and Houston in a number of ways, whether it be quarterback talent, because I'm a, I've always been a huge Deshaun Watson guy. I was so despondent when the Browns didn't take him. Uh, by the way, you I'm not. You, you could have. He could have fallen right into your lap. Yes, yes, twice actually. And uh, yeah. again, uh, I, I I was despondent then, comma not despondent now. But he's every bit the quarterback I thought he was going to be. But when you talk about front office and and coaching. First of all, front office, what front office? Houston doesn't have a GM at the moment. Coaching, no. I've never been a Bill O'Brien guy, especially since he came to the NFL. He just strikes me as one of these fake tough guys. I just, I, I, I've never bought into things with, with, with Bill O'Brien. I will restore honor and integrity to Penn State football. And by that I mean I will be out of here on the first thing smoking. That's right. He was... Uh, he was awarded the 2012 Big Ten Coach of the Year, but I have always felt by the transitive properties, that should have gone to Frank Solich because guess who beat him his first game there? That's right, your Ohio Bobcats, baby. Just had to get that in there. Uh, Frank Solich uh, owns Bill O'Brien's ass. And what, and, what, and, yeah, and, and, what, and what, speaking of guys uh, Speaking of guys employed to fetch coffee, uh, what future Cleveland Browns assistant... Was he quarterback for OU at that time, Rick? Don't you diminish the Browns' uh, quality coordinator or whatever the hell he is, Tyler Tettleton, the great Tyler Tettleton of the son Ohio of. Bobcats and the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Tyler Tettleton, son of? Uh, Mickey Tettleton, but we'll overlook that. Who played for? The Detroit Tigers, but we'll overlook yes, that. Yes, indeed. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll overlook all of that. Houston is just, again, they've got a lot of talent on both sides of the ball. Obviously, defensive line is one of the first things people think about. Uh, although, it, it also could be uh, Hopkins at wide receiver, who, in talking to fellow FDH Lounge dignitary Bob Glassman the other day, he was making a case for him for best in the league, and you, you could easily make that case. And uh, one of the rare non wide receiver franchise player prima donnas in the game today, a non prima donna, which is very, very rare among all of them. And look, I say that as a newfound Odell Beckham fan. I mean, he's playing for my team right now, but I'm not going to deny the guy's a prima donna. But Hopkins is pretty great without being one. Uh, the running back situation, everybody's saying they overpaid for Duke Johnson. I'm saying as a Browns fan, what's that third-round pick going to get us this year? So uh, Duke Johnson is going to end up, I think, paying some benefits for Houston. Uh, this is a guy who, uh, again, hasn't even been allowed to do as much as Gio Bernard, who's been used fleetingly in Cincinnati. And you've seen the flashes of what Bernard can do. I think Duke Johnson used properly, which Houston is probably going to have no choice but to do. They'll get good results out of him. Again, I got him 9-7, and seven, which actually feels like a wimpy pick because it's a mid-range thing. If everything went perfectly for them, they could win the division. But they could also implode the way that our fellow uh, dignitary Chris Galloway thinks Baltimore is going to. They could be 5-11 and 11 just because of, again, the front office uh, slash coaching situation here, the instability. I'm picking them for the middle ground, still above 500, but missing the playoffs. I would agree with that. We talked about the Indianapolis Colts offensively, the whole being greater than the sum of his parts. You look at Houston, the sum of its parts is every bit as good as you think it is. Deshaun Watson ranked slightly just behind Baker Mayfield uh, when I put together the triplets thing. Hopkins, number one wide receiver in this league. Will Fuller would be a number one wide receiver on any other team in this league. Lamar Miller, um, outstanding running back. Jordan Thomas, I'm a big fan of. Uh, 
they are, when I put together that triplets um, uh, piece that I was talking about, they came up ahead of Dallas, ahead of Seattle, ahead of Kansas City. Largely, that is because of Kansas City's running back, not the point. Um, offensively, I cannot say in terms of skill position players, again, they are every bit as good as you think they are, and they are better. Then we talk about the offensive line. Titus Howard, Senio Calamente, Nick Martin, Zach Fulton, Max Sharping. I think there are five guys in that Pico Foods plant in Mississippi that the administration raided <laughs> that I would take over the five of them. Well, All right. I, I don't know about that, and that's because the five guys you're talking about are probably uh, relatively malnourished compared to NFL players. <laughs> Line, but but yes. you understand my point. This is a, I won't say they are a dead last offensive line in this league. They are certainly a bottom eight, if not bottom four um, league. And, and it, it, it amazes me. And, and, and I go back to when Jerry Jones, you know, built from the offensive line. And, and yeah, there were questions about quarterback and questions about offensive talent. But now you look at... Travis Frederick, you look at Tyron Smith, you look at that offensive line, what they did, and whether Elliott ends up, Ezekiel Elliott ends up playing this season or not, they're still going to have a very good year because they built, much like the Indianapolis Colts, exactly the way you are supposed to build a team. You know, it amazes me, it astounds me that you look at the wattage they have on defense, no pun intended, and no pun allocated. You look at the ones they have in terms of skill position players on offense. For the offensive line, which is a key to this team, it's a key to any franchise in this league, to be this bad. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really, really going to hold them back. There's no question about it. And, uh, again, it's, it's a franchise that just has uh, really a, a lot of question marks because we, we've talked about the good points and the bad points. There's one thing that I want to uh, bring up here uh, as I'm invoking other FDH Lounge dignitaries. I'll, I'll invoke one who is also a childhood friend, good buddy uh, Johnny Adams, who uh, he recently has been sort of on a roll trying to – he has become a curator of all things smarmy. So one of his favorite sayings from me is whenever I will bring up the phrase where I will compare somebody to that great phrase – Brazil is the country of the future, and it always will be. You mentioned Will Fuller. I think we could say the same thing about him as far as wide receivers go. See, I don't. I mean, if you look, if you looked around, if you looked around wide receivers in this league, there are number ones on teams that I would take him over. Um, you know, I mean, you put him. I mean, look, I mean, how much would how much would Seattle prefer him to Tyler Lockett? You put him in New England. Um, you put him, you know, uh, it, would Cam Newton take him over D.J. Moore? Would Sam Darnold take him over Robbie Anderson? I think the answer to all of those questions is yes. Um, now, I, again, I, I love what they have done. I love what they've done with the skill position players. Defensively, despite the fact they lost the Honey Badger, who also, for a minute and a half, attended the Louisiana State University, and then I don't remember exactly what happened to him. But, you know, J.J. Watt, Jadavian Clowney, um, Zach Cunningham, Whitney Merciless, Bernard McKendrick, um, Jonathan Joseph, Sean Gibson. I mean, tell me a better assemblage of defensive talent in terms of just star power. I'm not talking about scheme. I'm not talking about all 11 of them playing together. I'm saying individual star talent. Give me somebody better than Houston. And in terms of Watson, Miller, Hopkins, Fuller, Thomas, give me a five that are, you know, give me a five that, that you know, can measure up to them. Again, my question is, we talked about the offensive line a second ago, and I do not, to quote uh, Tom Brokaw, uh, asking Michael Dukakis a question from 1988, I don't mean to beat this drum until it has no more sound. However, oh, this is a quarterback that has not exactly been able to stay healthy in the past. Wait a minute. You're, put, you're, put, you're putting over Will Fuller 
and you're saying, I'm not sure Deshaun Watson is healthy enough for my tastes. What? I'm saying in terms of talent for Will Fuller, would I take him over other guys I mentioned in this league? Yes. Deshaun Watson, in terms of being healthy, I'm relating that to the offensive line. I'm not talking about the relative health of Deshaun Watson or Will Fuller. All right, all right. Yeah, as far as the offensive line goes, uh, I can see that. Yeah, there's a lot of star talent there uh, defensively and – that's the thing. But again, particularly when you uh, look at the offensive line, Houston really exemplifies the whole stars and scrubs thing that we've talked about on this show in recent years with teams me, in the league. Let, Unfortunately, let, all the scrubs let, are on the old line. I was going to say, let me, in, let, let me insert a, since we talked professional wrestling already, let me insert uh, a favorite Bob, uh, Bobby Heenan line of uh, yours and mine. Houston's offensive line is a real who's who. Of who's that? Yes. <laughs> I will always pop for a great Bobby Heenan reference, as I'm sure uh, would frequent FDH Lounge guest and national radio host Jody McDonald. So well played there. Yes, I will. I, I will be. Yes, I will be uh, reflecting on that uh, uh, line I just gave you uh, while eating some ham and eggs late night. Uh, yes, yes, and that. Uh, well, that that right there might be uh, more excitement that you'll be having then we will have in talking about the team uh, that, uh, that, that, is, that personifies to me just missionary position football in the NFL, the Tennessee Titans. You know, every year, are they 7-9, and nine, are they 8-8, eight and eight, are they 9-7? and seven? They're somewhere in there. They're, they're going to bore the piss out of you, whatever they do. I mean, they're, they're going to be in there, and they're going to grind, and they're going to – I mean, they're better than they were when Jeff Fisher was the coach, yes, but it, it's almost like he left behind this horrible fungus that just puts a boring ceiling and a boring floor on them. And part of that ceiling has to do – there's always – that's the constant in Tennessee. There's always something that, that causes both a ceiling and a floor. The biggest thing with the ceiling at this point is the health of Marcus Mariota. Is he ever going to be healthy enough to become the kind of guy that we thought he was capable of becoming coming out of college? And, uh, again, I think they're going to have a decent year. I got him penciled in at 8-8, eight and eight, but uh, it's not going to be anything sensational. We know this. They're probably not going to have a horrible year. Mike Vrabel's a good coach. That's part of the floor that they have there. Uh, for Tennessee, they're just a big friggin' pile of beige. What say you? If you remember Blur Song 2. Yeah. <laughs> woo The Tennessee Titans are like, woohoo. Oh. There's... There's more excitement in three minutes of blur than there is in an entire Tennessee Titans season, typically. I, I would go. I would go. To, I would go as far as say two full seasons. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, Mariota. I'm in the minority as I was on the, uh, as I was in the minority on on Andrew Luck. I didn't love him coming out of college. I mean, Luck has Luck has mostly proven me wrong. Although the next big playoff game he wins will be his first. Uh, Marietta, I go back to having watched the first ever uh, college football national championship game, you know, and I didn't love him against what I thought was an average. I mean, look, it was there's there, no question it, that was a star-studded offensive Ohio State team. I thought the defense, okay, you know, with the, I mean, with obviously the exception of Joey Bosa, who went on to be unbelievable. Um, I thought that, you know, defensively, not a great team, and yet he underwhelmed me in that game. I, you know, when those top two picks came up, I would not have taken Jameis Winston for reasons that we have talked about. In fact, I, I went so far with you as to say, if I was a GM, I would have gone to my owner and said, you will fire me before I will take him. Yeah. Mariotta, I didn't have that strong an objection to, but if I was Tennessee at that point, yes, I understand you're looking for a quarterback because I think Zach Mettenberger was your quarterback then. Yeah. Um, I still would have I still would have traded down and seen what kind of assets that I could have picked up. Um, Derrick Henry, I I I like, but he somehow kind of. He's been very good since Bama, but I would even I would even take Mark Ingram in terms of Alabama running backs and what they've been able to do in the NFL. The wide receivers, 
air, Corey Davis in spots, Delaney Walker. Uh, I think that I mean, look, their most high wattage player uh, on their on their offense to me is Taylor Luan, yes. who I love, who I love coming out of Michigan. Um, I think he's you know I think he's a top five tackle in this league, maybe the best left tackle in this league. Um, you know, but and, and defensively, you look at that roster. Um, you know, Malcolm Butler. You know who is Malcolm, Malcolm Butler, who will who is the defensive equivalent of Freddie Mitchell, who to this day I understand is still signing for the twenty six catches. Malcolm Butler will be signing, you know, jumping uh, that route in the Super Bowl picture from now to the day he dies. Kenny Vaccaro, I like, but I don't love. Cameron Wake, it depends on what Sunday you want to catch him on. Wesley Woodyard is a good linebacker. He's not a great linebacker. You know, there's just, I mean, they are, I, I once, you know, I once, I go back, I go back to, I'll throw, a friend's ref, I'll throw a friend's reference at you that, you know, the, when, when, when Rachel had broken up with Ross and he was start, and she was starting to, to date a guy named Ross who was, you know, David Schwimmer are dual role, and Chandler Bing said of Ross and Russ, they were as different as, quote, night and later that night. <laughs> the Tennessee Titans can best be described as night and later that night. Yes. Uh, I, I thought you were going to make a on a break reference there when you were talking about friends or phalange, but I'm glad you stayed away from both of those because they would have been very hackneyed. Uh, as far as it goes with Mariota, I mean, look, he was somebody where I, I wasn't down on him coming out, but I had a little bit of a question coming out of the Oregon system. Sometimes when quarterbacks are in a gimmicky system, you wonder what they're going to be like. So that was a thought for me, and uh, again, that, that may have something to do with why he hasn't developed further. Uh, he may, uh, i tell you what, though, uh, and this is one of these things where when I talk about uh, Tennessee's season having a, a, a relatively high floor, if not a high ceiling, the one thing that could go against that, Taylor Luan will miss game one, which means he will yeah. not be there to block Miles Garrett, which could mean R.I.P. And, 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 Marcus and, and, Mariota. And, and look, I know, look, I know you are salivating over that as a Browns fan, yeah. but just as a, as a tape rat and as a guy who enjoys football, I mean, don't you look forward? Aren't aren't you, aren't you unhappy that you don't get to see for sixty snaps that day just that individual matchup? Sure, but like I said to people uh, that uh, during the two thousand fifteen to two thousand eighteen period, you know, it's not good for the NBA that only two teams are dominating. But my team is one of the two teams, so I don't care. So that's how I look at it. I mean, as a you think, and let me throw this out there, and this is gonna up, this is gonna upset Bears fans. Uh, do you think that Marcus Mariota is simply Hawaiian for Mitchell Trubisky? He might be. He might be. I mean, uh, I think people still think that uh, he has a higher ceiling than Trubisky. We'll we'll see what uh, Matt Nagy can get out of him this year. Uh, year two in that system is going to be very very oh, revealing. And I would- and I would submit that, yeah, absolutely. Matt Nagy is, is Matt Nagy is is, is better than is, is is better than what they have in Tennessee. Not only in terms of as a head coach, you know, just a, just an offensive mind. Yeah. Um. You know that you know, and 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 and, and please no and please no one talk about Matt Lafleur. All right. Yeah. But my point is. You know, I look at a ba- you know, I, w- I look at a Baker Mayfield, no question that's my guy. I look at a Russell Wilson, no question that's my guy. I look at a Sam Darnold, no question that's my guy. I look at a Marcus Mariota, it's like, okay. You look at a Marcus he- Mariota and you just say, oh, he looks uh, handsome in a Hawaiian shirt. Hashtag no homo. But, uh, you know. That's, I, I don't know what else you could say about him at this point, but uh, Tennessee is, uh, again, they are the beige of the NFL. Then you have Jacksonville, uh, who we were talking about last here, who, uh, again, though, we've talked about this, though, this is more of a fluid, not to say gender fluid, division uh, than some of the other ones in football. So they're less of a lock to be in last place than are the Bengals and Dolphins, who we've already covered. 
But uh, Nick Foles comes down there. Big game, Nick. Uh, I know they think they were just a Nick Foles away from the Super Bowl, but that was then and this is now because you can't go back to where they were two years ago. Blake Bortles playing in the AFC Championship game, which future generations will marvel about if they're still here. But still, Jacksonville, again, excellent talent defensively. Uh, Leonard Fournette is starting to look like he's got a great future behind him, a guy that I was very high on coming out. He's got to prove he can stay and healthy. And, 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 not, and, and I don't want to interrupt you, but I made obviously several references to LSU, and I remember watching the draft when they took him fourth overall. Yeah. And the guy, and the guy sitting beside me as I screamed at one of the televisions in the place I was watching, they said, wait. Aren't you an LSU guy? And I said, yes. And that should tell you why I'm not cheering and or standing up on a table screaming for this guy. Yeah. All right. I remember Les Miles saying freshman year during a workout that if he ever, you know, if, 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 if he got, you know, basically his stuff together, he was going to be fun to watch. To me, this is a guy who never got his stuff together. When the Cowboys took Ezekiel Elliott at four, I said, absolutely, that's the right pick. When the Giants took Saquon Barkley at two, absolutely, that's the right pick. Why? Because you're not drafting running backs in those positions. You're drafting transcendent football players. Leonard Fournette is a transient football player. Well, again, a big power-speed combo guy. I'm always a mark for guys like that. Witness what I said about Nick Chubb before. But he was never healthy. Yeah. He didn't didn't show up at all again. I think he had 100 yards in three years against Bama. I mean, everybody points to the one run against Auburn that year. That's an Auburn team that I think ended up finishing 7-5. Like, I just... Explain to me why you loved him, because I'm just not, I, again, I saw him up close for three years. I never believed in him. Well, his, his tools. I, I thought that, again, part of it is he hasn't really been able to stay healthy, especially in the last year and a half or so. That's been part of it as well. Uh, and, again, if, if, he's, if he gets healthy again, I think he can prove you wrong. He's got the tools. He's an excellent player. Uh, he's got to be looking at a lot of eight, eight in the box, because this is a team that keeps – Somehow or another, and, and they, they've, you know, again, this is not not to take any steam off of Blake Bortles, uh, who really deserved it based on his play the last couple of years, but they've only gotten thinner and thinner and thinner at wide receiver and still not been as absolute garbage in the passing game as you would expect. So, no. you know, it, you would expect their passing game to be worse based on the roster that they have. Uh, but they've managed to remain competent. But at, at one of these days, you got to think that uh, Fournette's going to be facing a lot more eight in the box. Maybe Nick Foles, if, if he's having another one of his big-time years, uh, like not just the Super Bowl year, but the one earlier in the decade when I think he went something like 26 touchdowns, two interceptions in Philadelphia. Yep. But yep. I think Nick Foles, to me, is basically like a trillionaire's Kelly Holcomb like, he does better when teams aren't necessarily expecting to see him. Uh, because, I, I, again, pretty much before, the, the, the more he's played, the longer he's played, the quicker it's been for him to get exposed. Uh, if you're hoping for a different thing this time around in Jacksonville, uh, again, I'm afraid you're paying for the illusion that you saw from January and February uh, of the 2017 season here into 2018. So, We'll, we'll see how that goes, how that plays out. I don't have high hopes for Jacksonville. I've got them last in what should be a pretty competitive division. I think it'll be a very competitive division. I think, look, defensively, you know, Jay, you know Jalen Ramsey is, is great. Miles Jack, I would uh, – Miles Jack, uh, to me, is, is one of the better linebackers in this league. He's someone that – he's someone I would build the defense around. They are not defensively, though, what they were a couple of years ago. I think they've taken a step down. They rank 30th in terms of triplet combination um, in the ranking I did. Um, we talked about Fournette, Marquise Lee, D.D. Westbrook. Uh, good, not great. Um, offensive, line, offensive line, especially the interior with, with Brandon Linder and A.J. Kans, a question mark to me. Um you know, Jeff Swain, not a great tight end. I am pleased, by the way, to see that uh, 
Leonard Fournette, Alfred Blue, DJ Chark. Apparently, the Jacksonville Jaguars are running a refugee home for uh, former LSU Tigers. So there's that. <laughs> um, and on Nick Foles, you know, I will say this. You know, I threw out a Friends reference earlier. I'll throw out an ER one now. To Jacksonville fans hoping that Nick Foles is your savior, all I will say to you is that the longer you stay, the longer you stay. (laughs) Well, to bring it full circle on this division, I'll go to your reference about the Jacksonville Jaguars being a refugee home for former Cincinnati Bengals. The present administration is prepared uh, to tolerate that uh, so long as they don't uh, also start putting Syrians in the mix. But that's another story for another day. And right now, folks, this is where the part that was promised at the outset of this mini-episode, the little tack-on here at the end, uh, again, pulling back the kayfabe curtain, this one was in the can before Andrew Luck's announcement came out. Also, Lamar Miller's uh, injury, which, uh, sad to say for him, got completely overshadowed by the national media in terms of the impact of it, but it certainly affects both Houston and Indy as far as this division goes. So normally you get to this point in the preseason when we're taping these things, late in the preseason, and yeah, maybe this is a little earlier in terms of a couple of days than we generally do it, but uh, again, you get to the third week, there shouldn't be anything that should really happen, right, that would send any kind of a hand grenade into things. Wrong! Here we are, and uh, the landscape is different, and uh, as the old uh, congressional saying goes, Smalls, I wish to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. So ordered. <laughs> I recognize, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio. <laughs> That's the first time anybody's called me that in a while, and I'll take it. But uh, Wait, uh, that's the first time someone's called you a gentleman or from Ohio? Uh, gentleman, obviously. Uh, people know I'm from Ohio, but uh, gentleman is not much thrown around when attached to my name. And this is one of these things that's going to be a little bit jarring in terms of the continuity because we're obviously going to uh, be changing our divisional playoff predictions, uh, and that is always in the NFC West mini episode when we're wrapping these up so the fact that i have started coming down with a cold you hear me now jarringly sounding different i'm sure right now you're going to hear that then and we're also going to do a mini episode in this series here a little one about the peyton uh, (laughs) not peyton manning duh andrew luck retirement uh freudian slip and uh rick it feels like the year peyton manning was out it it does it absolutely does and uh again it was. Uh, we, we will be getting to uh, to all of that. As far as the impact here, uh, again, given that I only picked Houston uh, to finish behind them, or more or less by the uh, skin of the teeth here, uh, I'm back on Houston to win the division. I do not have Indianapolis now making the playoffs. I have Houston at nine and seven. I have Indianapolis at eight and eight on the outside looking in. I will say, FDH Lounge dignitary and FDH Director of Research Nate Noy texting me with the very bad take, one of a couple ones about uh, Andrew Luck, that no, now, now Indy's going to be 3-13, and 5-11. and 11. No, that's not going to happen. But 8-8, eight and eight, I, I see them just missing here at this point. Brissett got to be a competent quarterback, if nothing else, two years ago. And Frank Reich being there, and uh, again, uh, on both sides of the ball, the excellent coaching that they have. This team, it, it, it definitely has a relatively high floor, The talent uh, acquisitions have been getting better over the last year or two anyways, which just makes this all the more poignant. So, yes, I have Houston 9-7, Indy 8-8 on the outside looking in. Briefly upon Nate's point, their roster, the Indianapolis Colts roster, you will look at that roster and say, yes, subtract Andrew Luck, and their roster pound for pound is worse than the Buffalo Bills, worse than the Miami Dolphins, worse than the Oakland slash Las Vegas Raiders. You cannot make that. You absolutely cannot make that argument. As for, uh, I had Houston winning the division. I had Indianapolis as the final uh, squad into the playoffs. I still have Houston winning the division. Ironically, as you and I discussed, I was my thinking was ten and six. My thinking now is Houston's even you know, a step back, maybe two steps back. Uh, you know, nine and seven, winning the division, eight and eight. Uh, Indianapolis. They're not 3-13. and 13. That is a roster that Jacoby Brissett 
one game, one a game for the New England Patriots on Thursday night against the Houston Texas Texans after um, Jimmy Garoppolo was injured against. Ironically, Rick, your fish. Yeah. Uh, he is good enough to win games in this league. Is he good enough for those who would say, "Well, Stan Humphrey's got a team to the Super Bowl"? No. Stop. Right. Go to bed. And get up again. Right. Uh, their roster is still a very good roster. Their offensive line, without hesitation, I would take over the Houston Texans. Uh, they still have very comparable weapons. Jacoby Brissett is good enough to win games in this league. How many games? Six, seven. They go eight and eight. They have a roster good enough to go eight and eight, and that would be a very good year for Colts fans. They're not making the playoffs with Jacoby Brissett as their quarterback. Still have Houston winning the division. Have Indianapolis now not the first team out, but definitely not the last team in. Yeah, I mean, they're somewhere in the middle of that mix, and that's the thing here, too, that I'm a little bit surprised about this, that uh, for Nate, who prides himself on being a big Colts fan and ostensibly is paying attention to the roster building that's going on there, this is a situation where the Colts, I mean, if this had been maybe four years ago, yeah, given the awful state of affairs that the general manager had left behind at that time, uh, yeah, you, you could have seen something like that. Uh, a lot of times they would have just a garbage backup quarterback. Uh, part of the time it was Matt Hasselbeck who was over the hill, but was still, because Matt Hasselbeck was, was good in his prime, there were still remnants of it, but usually it was somebody worse than Matt Hasselbeck. This is not those days. They have a better situation there, and again, a very, very poignant situation for Indianapolis the next couple of years because this is a team where you're going to look at this roster and you go, wow, with a, with a healthy Andrew Luck, where would they be? And uh, Absolutely. And, 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 and again, the, Houston, the, the Indianapolis Colts offensive line, without question, I would take them over the Houston Texans offensive line. You look at you know, Marlon Mack, now that Lamar Miller has unfortunately uh, been lost for the season with his injury, Duke Johnson and Marlon Mack are very comparable running backs in this league. Can you compare anyone on the Indianapolis roster with DeAndre Hopkins? No, DeAndre Hopkins is the number one wide receiver in this league. Uh, however, Will Fuller, you know, better than Devin Funches, but you look at Indianapolis's wide receivers collectively, they match up well with Houston's wide receivers collectively. Tight ends match up very well, and there are you know, players on, if you review position by position the defenses yeah obviously Houston much more wattage in terms of you know JJ no pun intended and I know no pun allocated yes at defensive end you know Whitney Merciless Jadavian Clowney yeah there is there is more wattage in terms of Houston's defense however you know some of the defensive pieces that the Indianapolis Colts have compare very favorably with with Houston's pieces so it is a very good roster still. I agree with you completely. Again, it is a roster that is going to win games in this league. And, yes, you go from a top-five quarterback to a quarterback who is right not toward the bottom. He is the bottom, dead last. However, you're going to look at me and tell me this roster is less than the Miami Dolphins. Again, go to bed and get up again. Yeah. Ridiculous, uh, an overreaction by Nate and for anybody else who's saying this. Ironically, they'd be lucky if that was the case because then you could be in a tank for two a situation like the Dolphins and get a third franchise quarterback in a row in Indianapolis. That's that's. Yeah, that, someone once said that Andrew Luck following Peyton Manning was hitting the lottery. That did that absolutely did not happen. What would? To a Tunga Vailoa following Andrew Luck following Peyton Man. That is, that is winning the lottery and getting struck by lightning as you realize you win the lottery and you get a call from the girl in high school you always wanted to go out with. I mean, what would that be? That would be all of the above, I think. And uh, again, that is in all likelihood not going to be the scenario, but uh, I think we have accurately charted out what will be the scenario going through the post-Luck, post-Miller AFC South for this year. For Raymond Smalley, I'm Rick Morris. Thank you for checking out this mini-episode of the FDH Lounge. 
As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 